serve as acting chair for this meeting. Councilor Wheat. Okay. Okay, and second nominations be closed, John. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Attendance has been noted. If I could have a motion to approve the agenda. Member Pierce, Member Eddy, all those in favor? Good. If anyone has any uh, pecuniary interest, if they could declare at the appropriate time. Moving right along, I guess I should do this first. Call the meeting to order. It's done now officially. Uh, we'll start with delegations and um, the chair has to grant the 30 minutes? Or do I have choice on that yet? <laughs> it's granted <laughs> by the former chair. So Very Mr. good. Mr. Chairman, if I could. We were just speaking to the two officers, and Robin, I don't know whether you could introduce them, please. Or do you have? Jim Milson. Or is Jim, are you going to introduce them? OK, thank you. But anyway, we were just speaking to them, and they indicated they would cut that way back and then be open for questions. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Jim. And uh, so we'll just start with the uh, delegation from the OPP. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate the opportunity for the OPP to be here to uh, address the uh, committee in regards to the OPP billing model. Uh, you recall that on November 29th, I had the opportunity to speak from this podium and, and uh, deliver the 2018 billing model presentation to you. And at that time, there were a number of questions. At that time, there were a number of questions, and following that, uh, I received a few emails from some councillors who were uh, interested in certain aspects of that presentation. And uh, following that, at a, a police services board meeting, uh, one of the councillors attended and also had uh, some comments and questions on, on billing law. So we thought it wise to add another layer so that we could make sure there was no other questions. And if there, if there were, you had an opportunity to ask the people to deal with this every day across the province. So with me today is uh, Sergeant Peter Marshall from uh, our Municipal Policing Bureau. He's a contract analyst. And uh, Gilbert Cadieu is with him as well. He's also a contract analyst. So I'll turn it over to uh, Sergeant Marshall, and uh, you'll have time for questions uh, following their presentation. I have briefed them on some of the questions that were asked, and I'll try to address those. that pick my voice up a little, a little bit better, eh? Better. Let's just get this one out of the way. Okay. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for, uh, for the introduction and uh, Mayor Eddy. Uh, my name is Sergeant Peter Marshall. Um, I contract analyst with the Municipal Policing Bureau out of uh, OPP headquarters in Aurelia. And uh, as um, Actor, or acting Inspector uh, Millicent had, uh, had introduced. I have Sergeant uh, Gilbert Cadieu with me as well. Um, so we were tasked with providing or presenting you with a, um, an overview or maybe a little more in-depth uh, discussion regards to the OPB billing model. Uh, I know from past experience, from prior presentations, there seems to be, um, the hiccup tends to be kind of between the old way of billing where we used to bill for the FTEs 
and the new way now where we actually have you know like a, a base service and it calls for service section and whatnot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and, and, and try to explain the base and the calls for service. Um, if at any point you have a question, feel free. I don't mind uh, anybody just kind of jumping in and asking questions. Uh, a lot of times it's you might uh, get a lot of information during the course of the presentation, forget that question partway through. So uh, if you have a question, feel free to jump in. I have no, uh, no issues with that at all. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start off with, um, with the presentation itself. Once I figure out, beautiful. Okay. So adequate and effective policing. Uh, the Ontario Regulation 399 sets out the requirements for adequate and effective policing services. Uh, adequate and effective policing services of the OPP is monitored both internally and externally. Uh, internally by our quality assurance unit and externally by the provincial auditor. So we have two watchdogs that maintain um, an, an, an overview and oversight of, of how we deliver our policing services. Um, they do conduct these uh, these audits at regular or intervals and uh, follow up to monitor any items requiring corrective action. Um, as visible as you can see on the screen, uh, adequate and effective policing services all include crime prevention, law enforcement, assistance to victims of crime, public order maintenance, and emergency response. Uh, so this slide here, it shows you the budget of the Ontario Provincial Police, which currently sits at $1.123 billion. There's a provincial and municipal split. 65% of the budget is recovered provincially. Uh, the remaining 35% of the budget is recovered from the municipalities that we serve, much like yourselves. This is the portion that's recovered through the municipalities. Uh, it covers off, uh, so you have, it, this is where you have sort of your detachment staff. So it's going to cover off the supervision, frontline uh, constable, civilian administration, um, and support. Uh, the support positions can, has come, comes by way of the, the communication um, operators, sorry, uh, prison and guards, uh, provincial police academy, in service training, uniform recruitment, uh, the MPB, who I'm, I, uh, I'm gladly part of. Uh, quality assurance, forensic ident, IT and telephone support, and through our regional headquarters. Uh, all detachment servicing municipalities operate on an integrated service delivery model, whereby they police one or more municipalities and also look after the provincial obligations, for example, the King's Highways, uh, provincial parks and waterways. Our tracking systems ensure that our municipalities do not pay for provincial resources or obligations. So we have systems set up, uh, one example would be our daily activity reporting. Um, so each officer at the end of each shift has to go through and uh, they report how many hours they, they spent within a certain municipality. Um, now every detachment or most detachments are um, uh, who provide police and services for the municipalities, uh, the uh, provincial, the highways, or this sort of thing. They're all uh, split up into zones. So, uh, so officers, you may have one to say five officers, say, dedicated to a certain zone for that particular day. So those officers there would score the time they spent in that zone along with what they had been doing within that time period. So whether it was car accidents, whether it was domestic disputes, or this sort of thing, all that is recorded. So that each number as they come through, um, or accumulated and it comes to the billing aspect itself, we can say, okay, well, the, the county of Brant has X amount of hours or time spent, sorry, within, uh, say, domestic disputes, for example. Okay, so, so you're not paying for, uh, for another uh, municipality or another county outside of your own. These numbers are dedicated to, to, your, um, to your municipality. Uh, the integrated service delivery model allows attachments to share resources uh, with officers providing support for major incidents within their own uh, and neighboring detachments uh, where there are staffing pressures. So this may come into an example of when you may have a detachment short on, um, say you've got an officer off sick, for example, and the calls for service are coming in 
and all the current officers within that detachment are currently busy. So every vehicle that we have within the OPP, a uh, frontline vehicle, are equipped with a GPS system. The GPS system is then tracked through our communication centre. So for you folks, it'll be out of London. And essentially, it's much like you see here, it's like a great big huge map that's set up. And the call takers slash dispatchers can see where every vehicle is in your region. So if there's an incident happening in Brant right now, and, um, and the acting inspectors, um, uh, men and women, are, are, are busy with other calls for service, and there's an accident over here, well, they can say, okay, you know what, we've got one in the neighboring, uh, the neighboring detach or sorry, municipality over here. They're going to come over and give a hand and free up that time, take care of that, uh, that situation until possibly another officer from uh, Brant County can come, come down and take that, um, uh, that call for service. And, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So you're not, you're not limiting yourself to what you have in your detachment. So that kind of comes back to sort of the difference between the way you used to bill for the FTEs and how you're billing now under the new billing model. So it's a shared resource. So you're not paying for any more than what you normally would is just through a call, a call for service. So you have your base cost, which every municipality across Ontario pays the exact same amount. And that's essentially uh, what you'll see, and I'll explain later on in here, um, it's kind of like your bricks and mortar, I guess you could say, the foundation of what your detachment has to run on. So that keeps your detachment up and running. The calls for service are now the reactive portion of what we as the police officers will do when the calls for service do come in. Um, so I, I pretty much covered this off. The officers in a detachment are not designated as a municipal or provincial officer as we do work within various locations throughout the shift. And this comes back to what I was explaining before with the DAR system of how we record our time for the course of the day. That starts to differentiate how a municipality is billed and, how they are, and what they are not billed for. Uh, so detachments operating on an integrated service delivery model whereby uh, they may provide policing services to contract and non-contract municipalities and meet the provincial policing commitment. So and that comes down to the differences between what a contract and what a non-contract municipality is um, with the police services board, obviously, uh, you're very well aware of that, or you, or you don't. Um, however, the way we do, we do our policing, it doesn't matter if it's contract or non-contract, it's the same right across the board. There's no, some people believe there's a higher level or higher tier, there are no higher, te or higher tiers, it's just one level straight across the board. The only time you start seeing differences is if the municipality recognizes that maybe they need an extra body for, say, a school resource officer. Well, that's an enhancement, which the municipality would agree that, say, you know what, I think we need to pay for that officer to solely commit their time to that specific role. And then that's what they do. How, um, short of that, though, all detachments run equally across the board, again, contract or non-contract. And at the end of this, uh, we, uh, we actually track our services uh, through the, uh, the DAR system, so the Daily Activity Reporting System, which I explained a few minutes ago. Do you have any questions at this point from anybody? No? Is it self explanatory Does it make sense, or am I speaking in another language? <laughs> okay. So... Just looking at the history of how the billing model came to be, um, an extensive community engagement planning and clear, clear direction from the Auditor General, we heard that what our municipalities were asking us for was a more transparent uh, financial billing model which uh, reallocated the cost of policing amongst uh, municipalities in a fair and transis, uh, or sorry, uh, transparent manner. The, the, the OPP billing model is based on the fundamental principle that all services require a base level of infrastructure. And this comes back, as I said before, the, uh, the bricks and mortar, so to speak, of, of each detachment. Um, but they require this level of infrastructure for supervision, administrators, or administration, the sufficient frontline policing necessary to provide adequate and proactive policing, uh, while ensuring the general safety and security of all municipalities. The, or the billing model did take place on the 1st of January 2015. And the billing model applies to the municipalities policed by the OPP as of the 1st of January 2015. Newly amalgamating municipalities, so if you have a municipality which years ago you had the Paris Police Service, um, 
if at some point they decide that they want to come to us, actually come to the, go to the ministry, request a costing, the ministry uh, informs us, then we come to you and present that costing. And uh, if the, the costing we have presented to you seems fair um, and possibly a lot less than what you currently pay for, you may disband your police service and choose your policing uh, services through the OPP. At that point, because you have not been uh, policed by the OPP, um, there will be a, a, th a three plus year contract where we need to take that time to build up our data. So that is actually sort of going back to the old way of policing of an FTE based. So it's, it's so many officers that uh, will require to police your, your, uh, your municipality and it's uh, all based on, um, on a, s a set amount of hours. So the rationale behind the billing model, the billing model was based on the rationale that all municipalities should pay an equitable share for the provision of police and services outlined in the PSA. And we'll explain those components of the billing model in a few minutes. This here is actually pretty self-explanatory. It's actually kind of a neat, uh, it's a neat graph. So what you're looking at the, at the end there was back, it was say 2014 and going back where every municipality was paying just a, a wide array of uh, varying costs for policing where it ranged anywhere from like $6 a property up to say uh, over $800 per property. And, and that was where we, we recognized that we need to develop some billing model again that was a little more transparent and that brought everybody together. So the, the municipalities, once we developed the billing model that fell under the billing model, saw a drastic change in the amount of money that they were paying per property. I believe, I believe within the first year you saved close to $2 million, I believe, like within the first amount um, going from 2014 to 2015. So you were one of those exceptions or one of those examples of where you saw a drastic change in uh, the amount that you're paying drop. In two years? Okay. Um, however, there were those municipalities that were only paying, say, $6, and they saw this huge increase, and of course, and it was just yelling and screaming and that sort of thing. But it comes down to that there's, there's an equitable share that everybody has to pay. You can't run a police service or a detachment on $6 per property. There's just no possible way of doing it. But that's how it was being done at one point in time. Uh, so you can see that over the years, um, over the next three years, how it's been brought together. And it's just a, it's a lot more streamlined. And that's the way that it's going now. Everybody is starting to pay their equitable share. So here's the difference, or sorry, 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 an explanation of how the billing model itself works. Um, as before, we were explaining 2000 to 2014 and prior, you were paying an FTE based. This is the, uh, the cost recovery under the billing model. So as I explained before, with the, uh, the base policing, um, this is your, your, your bricks and your mortar, as I've referenced before. Um, so it's the cost that's allocated amongst the municipalities on an equal uh, per property basis. So this is households, commercial, and industrial properties. It covers the legislative activities such as crime prevention, general and directed patrol, uh, officer availability to respond to emergency calls and victim assistance, proactive uh, patrol such as ride, community policing, uh, traffic safety. Uh, it may also include, uh, say, just kind of the old style of walking the beat. If, if you've got the, uh, the resources that particular day or that week, you may have an officer just maybe do a couple of uh, uh, patrols up and down the street uh, by foot, just greeting the public and that sort of thing. Uh, officer training and of course, this does cover all inspector and staff sergeant positions under your, um, in, within your detachment. And that could be the complete cost or if you're well, a municipality that has uh, different uh, municipalities within it, and they split those costs up. The calls for service portion, uh, this is associated with the crime call. So this is where your reactive policing comes out, where you've got, say, assaults, B&Es, drug charges, um, et cetera. Uh, you may do an MVC with a, a PI or a PD. 
uh, your provincial statutes under the MHA, trespass to, which is Mental Health Act, the Trespass to Property Act, et cetera, um, and general calls for service, alarm calls, missing persons, et cetera. There will be additional calls built into that, which municipalities are built for on their specific usage. So this could be uh, overtime, court security, if you happen to have a courthouse within your municipality, uh, cleaning caretakers, if uh, you do not own the building yourself, it's a, it's a building that's owned by, say, uh, say owned by the OPP, Infrastructure Ontario and whatnot. Um, accommodations enhancements, uh, which we spoke, to, or spoke of earlier in regards to, um, say, a community uh, or school resource officer. Uh, and and uh, prisoner transportation. Now, I don't have binoculars for this. Um, however, as a breakdown of the various costs associated with the, uh, the magical number of costs for the base service per property of 191.35. Um, so this is where you will see where your money is going uh, per property. So such as we had the top up there, you can see where the, uh, say the inspector or the staff sergeant's positions and what you're covering off, what your portion of that is, whether it's 100% or whether it's uh, um, a small percentage. The, uh, so this is your calls for service. And you can, there's a list below there, which are your billable calls. And uh, so in order to achieve those call, calls, there, there's a, a weighted provincial average that they've determined for this specific billing cycle of where each, uh, each investigation is allotted so many hours on an average to that specific call. Because they do change. You may spend five minutes doing a, uh, a B and E and find that it's not, or you may spend five hours doing the B and E. So again, this comes back to how the officers are gonna score their time within DARS, which municipality it is, and, uh, and then all that is fed into uh, uh, through the financial end, and then out comes your bill at the end of that. The calls for service cost represents related uh, reactive policing services that are usually required um, uh, for police officers' attendance. So this is where we're actually called out and we go and visit. Um, and, and speak to the, uh, the complainant. Municipalities are billed for the actual number and type of reactive calls for service. Uh, municipality pays a proportionate share of the total municipal reactive calls for service costs. So this is, comes back to when I was saying there's a, a provincial weighted average for each call. Uh, and then a total of all that shows what your percentage is, what sits in there, and then you pay that appropriate percentage compared to the, uh, uh, the province itself. Your additional cost components. So you have overtime. Municip municipalities that are billed overtime from occurrences in their geographic area uh, in relation to proportion to their detachment over time, not linked to a specific municipality. So that could be training um, and administrative duties. So this may be something that requires overtime to bill to the municipalities, but it takes the officer out of the municipality itself for training. So they go to say, um, me myself, as I work in Central Region, I go from my office down to our central region, or sorry, our um, general headquarters where we have our training outfit and I spend the week there at training. So if there's any overtime or costs um, related to that, uh, these are where the additional cost components come in. Uh, court security, um, as I said before, if you have a, um, a court in your ju jurisdiction, you are responsible for the full cost of court security under the Pro uh, Provincial Police Services Act. Municipalities with uh, court are charged for the cost of the, or to provide designated court security activities. And municipalities that do not have a courthouse in their municipality are not charged for court security either. So. Uh, again, prisoner transportation, uh, accommodation and cleaning, and dedicated enhancements. So again, this comes back to the enhancements that if you recognize that you want an officer for a specific role, uh, you can come and present that to the detachment commander or the de detachment commander may come to you and say, I think we're, we need to look into this. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Then that, um, that's not the be all and the end all. You may agree to it, but it still has to come back to our regional headquarters where there's a steering committee. They'll sit down and decide whether they need 
or can afford to keep that enhanced officer because you bring that officer in you've got to uh, you're investing your time and your money and it can't be something where three months later you're like you know what I don't think we need this guy anymore they're already committed to that detachment uh, so you have to give a year's notice if you're going to cancel that enhancement. So that's why um, within each region, with each in, in, in each headquarter, they need to decide whether they can uh, back this request or whether they don't back this request. So it's a, it's a call that, that every, every player within um, the policing end makes, and that includes yourself, the detachment commander, and our regional headquarters as well. So this is your billing statement, your recent one. Did you want to go over this at all, or are you good with that end of it there? You're good? Okay. And I'm sure you're, very, oh, you're all very well aware. Um, however, there's your, your numbers there, starting with 2014, coming to the drastic. It's just a huge cut right from the very beginning there of uh, coming from 7.6 down to 5.1 to 5.2 and 2018 uh, you've now plateaued off with uh, those caps not being put in place anymore and your average rate now cost per property is exactly the provincial averages itself so you guys are doing pretty good given that you were 2014 521 dollars per property so it's uh, it's cut a, a huge amount off of that Uh, year in adjustment. Did you want to go over the year in adjustment or are you comfortable with that aspect as well? You're all good? Okay. So for the 20 team minutes, we'll cover your breakdown. Your, your, base, your, your base services and call for service, that's calculated by applying the actual salaries, benefits, municipal cost recovery formula, support and equipment uh, to the applicable FTEs. And 28T, the recoveries of 2,152 uniform officers or FTEs and 191 FTEs or civilian FTEs. And this does not in, uh, include the enhancements, court security, prisoner transport. So the base services across the province is 191.35. And, and then each one is a breakdown of the amount per million that the, uh, for, for the recovery end of it, which provides the percentage and coming up to a total average of $355 per property for um, across province of Ontario. So again, this is where you're sitting yourselves, read that. this one here because this one's a little small on my sheet here uh, so this is gonna be a breakdown of the uh, the billing of uh, just a billing snapshot in regards to the uh, where are we here I can't even see my own sheet here so we're starting with a total of and later on in a, in a couple of slides there so for the total municipal, municipal police cost recovery, this comes back to the 35% portion of the pie graph that I was showing you earlier. Um, so currently at 403 million, uh, and you can see how it just drops down. So cost of policing does go up. However, you'll start seeing a drop off right at the base cost for services. So right now we're at uh, currently 191.35. Um, back in 2015, it was at 291. So not a huge drop in the average cost, but it is a drop nonetheless. Well, that was supposed to be your pie graph or your uh, another graph there, but what's that? Oh, would it come on stage maybe? Oh, look at that. That's why I have Gilbert here. 
Okay, so the base, co uh, base service cost, uh, stated earlier in the presentation, uh, the budget is, is about uh, a little over $1.1 billion. And we know from all of our tracking mechanisms and reporting from the various bureaus that it costs approximately $404 million to provide the municipal policing services. So this is where we're going to start with the, the base cost of 217.5. And this is the cost that is split among, or across the province for the 191.35 per property. The call for service at one, or 150.7 million. So as all calls for service come in, total, total is the, uh, the amount of 150.7 million. And that is where we get the percentage of what each municipality pays, and it's applied to that portion, which provides your per property amount um, in the end. Oops. And then you're going to have the other costs, which we were talking about court security, uh, et cetera. And those costs are, uh, are listed within your billing itself, whether you have to pay cleaning costs, whether there's any overtime, any court security, prisoner transport, et cetera. That's it for my riveting presentation on the, uh, the billing model. Um, I don't think it's anything new. Um, say, from, from speaking to, uh, to Acting Inspector Nelson there, I, I believe he's actually provided you a pretty good breakdown of the process as it is, uh, with the exception of maybe a couple of fancy graphs. I think he got pretty much nailed it right on the, uh, right on the head. So, um, are there any questions at this point that anybody has in regards to? Thank you very much. Nothing at all. Any questions? Member Powell. <clears throat> Through to the officer. <clears throat> if we have an incident in Brank County mm -hmm. and we call in the OPP helicopter, how is that charged and to who? It's not charged to you. So, it so that's a, pr a provincial resource. So it would be much like if you had a homicide within, uh, right across the street in downtown, I hope it wouldn't be any across the street because the OPP detachment's there. Um, but you may bring in a specialized investigative services such as our um, Criminal Investigations Bureau. They would come in, but there's no costs to the municipality. The only cost would be incurred is any overtime that might be um, allotted by the officers in relation to that investigation, like your, the, the detachment officers. So, but to bring in an inspector, and all those investigators, um, again, unless it's an investigator, say, to the local crime unit, you're not going to be billed for those services. So if OPP the helicopter comes in, if the canine comes in, there is no billable uh, cost to the municipality. If I ask a second one, when the uh, county jail in Brantford is closed and we now transport prisoners to, I guess it's just outside of Milton, I know it's averaged out in the province, but does that ultimately mean our cost is going to be a bit higher for that service going forward? I don't believe they oh, could for, for a prisoner yeah. transportation, if, if the cost goes up, it's, it's calculated provincially. So let's say, and I'm just picking numbers, let's say it's a million dollars a year. And because of this, it'll be 1.1. Well, now the 1.1 is divided by the number of officers that provide municipal policing. So, because it's a, it's a, uh, it's a per, well, we, we calculate as a per property cost, but it, they're just basically divided by, if we have 1.1 million properties in Ontario to provide municipal policing to, that's what it's divided by. So, the cost will go up, but it won't all go up to you, even though it's an area, it'll go up provincially and, and get diluted to the whole province. Yep. Member Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, three to the presenter. A um, couple questions, if I could. One general, um, and then a couple county specific. I was just wondering. Um, uh, one of the things we see growing is, is cyber crimes, and I think the OPP does deal with that. And um, but the, I don't think they deal with that at the detachment level, do they? Or do they deal with it at? Well, uh, each level? each region will have. Um, I believe they're dedicating a certain amount of cyber investigators, if it's a lack of a better word. Um, 
so if there's an investigation at this detachment that requires, um, say, a cell phone or a computer to be, to be looked at, they're going to have certain officers that can kind of do a triage of it um, and maybe extract a certain amount of information. But for the most part, if it requires, say, a warrant to go into, um, most of those items are sent to our headquarters where we have our e-crimes unit. And then they'll continue with that investigation or at least assist the, uh, the detective constable or the provincial constable with that portion of the investigation. So it's not, it's not a service that comes back to the municipality saying, okay, well, here's your bill for our e-crimes unit. That's another provincially funded um, unit. So it's, it's no cost to the uh, municipality. I just, I, I think that's something that's growing. But um, Okay, so the base service that we pay um, is for, in, you said uh, in one of your slides, general and directed patrol. So general patrol, um, we're going to have, you know, a patrol car out in uh, this section of the county or in pairs. We're going to have foot patrols. Um, and we pay for that every year. And there's a formula, is there not, that determines how many officers we should have? Is that correct? Nope. No. There's Who determines, I thought that, that, was that not the case at one time, that there was a model that determined how many OPP officers we needed? Yeah, and that comes back to what I was explaining with before was um, um, a community may grow at some point in time, and uh, so it'll have to be addressed at that point in time because, I mean, you can, you can always assume saying, well, I think we're going to grow by X amount of households. And... Um, so we want to make sure that we've got the policing resources available. So this is, comes back to where the way the billing model has been des designed is that if the resources are required, you're going to get those resources. And it may not come at the cost of bringing in extra personnel uh, to cover those off. Um, it's bringing people temporarily, say, from another detachment to assist, and then they go back to their detachment sort of thing, right? So it's still all based on calls for service. Um, and as long as those calls for service are being answered and are being taken care of, um, there, there, there is no model that says, well, you have to have X amount of officers in your detachment. Okay. Right? If, that, okay, I, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. Maybe I was misinformed. But it's my understanding, and maybe Inspector Milson can correct me, but um, yes, we've seen the cost of our policing come down to the provincial average that it should be, but it also seems that the number of patrols have been decreasing as well. Is, is, that, is that true? Like the number of foot um, patrols? I can't, I can't comment on, on what, <coughs> what visually you would see or you don't see within the detachment. And, well, and well, the patrols, based on but the, the patrols are based on, um, as, each, as each member um, comes in for their shift and they go out for their shift, it comes down to whether, are they patrolling in the area because now you know, they might find it impaired or this sort of thing, or whether they're going to a specific call for service. But as far as, and, and the inspection can comment, but most detachments don't have a specific, okay, you guys have to have this amount of patrols done, right? Um, as far as patrolling a neighborhood goes, I guess it's, I'm not, I'm not too sure if I can really, really comment on patrols going down because, again, there are no numbers, set numbers saying that, well, you have to have this many patrols. The officer comes in. They'll do their patrol of their neighborhood or of their zone, their specific zone, and they're doing their calls for service at the same time as well. Okay. Like I say, it just seems like the number of hours we've had have gone down, but uh, I'll, we'll follow that up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that could be a question that you can take up with, um, with, your, with your detached commander, if that you feel as though there's a, there is a problem that maybe you're not seeing um, um, a police presence and maybe it's a, it's a specific area. Uh, the other with, uh, thing with the OPP is that there's a lot of analytically driven policing now. So, because based on ana analytics, you can d identify certain areas that might be a problem. So maybe you got the, the corner of up, let's say, at, at, is it Dumfries, Dumfries? The street that's up there. You know, maybe there's a big crack house up there and there's a lot of issues going on in that area. And uh, so then the inspector will have his members maybe in that area cracking down trying to take care of that and you may not see a police presence in another area um, so a lot of times not only are you out trying to do patrols and be proactive but you're also going to go out and um, and focus on an area that might be identified as a troubled area right 
to take care of that, to eliminate that problem, and then move on to the next one as well. Um, but if you don't, if you believe that you're not seeing the uh, the police presence, then that that would be where your police services board or, or the council may want to address that with the detached commander, and see if there's something you can kind of come to in a common ground to uh, uh, to resolve that. Member Powell. So you need to, uh, Sergeant. Is there a trend in the OPP to hire more civilian people? Uh, not that administration is not important, but when we hear presentations, it's sometimes our most highly qualified officers who are giving us all this paperwork, which seems like what a better use be to keep your qualified officers what they might do best out in the field and hire administrative executive types to <coughs> do all that paperwork, computers, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't comment on how the OPP does or doesn't do their hiring and who they're going to put in certain positions. However, I can, I can comment that, um, say, given, given my position or um, Sergeant uh, Kadju's position, is that when you come in, you present this information, it's nice to have that background, a policing background, so that when you do ask those questions about uh, presence in a, in a municipality, you know, or we're not seeing officers, or a police-related question, you may have a civilian that may just there, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't have that background, right? Um, so it may be an anecdote on my part to give some personal experience from, uh, from a policing aspect as to, uh, that might bring some sort of resolution to the question that you're asking. So. Um, in certain positions, you definitely need to have a subject matter expert that is a sworn officer who has had that, that history, that background to, um, to provide those answers to you. But absolutely, I, I completely agree, there are a lot of positions that do require the expertise of a qualified civilian as well. And we have numerous, numerous civilians. Um, the majority of them, you, you will see though, being in either a regional or a general headquarter situation. Uh, because each detachment, um, for the most part, are made up of police officers to go out and take care of those calls for service with the exception of say your detachment administrative clerks and uh, uh, all right it's just, it tends to be an equal balance and, and those positions are all identified at some point in time by bigger and better people than myself to say you know what that's a better that's better served as a civilian or this is better served as an officer so. thank you Seeing no further questions, I appreciate your time. Thank you for okay. coming out and for your presentation. Thank you. We're going to moving on to uh, your worship. The clerk will make sure that they get into their Friday files. Very good. Moving right along, then I'd like to welcome Sarah Reynolds from BFL Canada forward. And just so you're aware, we've had the opportunity to see your presentation already. Thank you for providing that. Excellent. And uh, do you uh, do you want to get a contact name like an email of the presentation to anybody who uh, members who aren't here tonight? I can. I just say I can. I can email a presentation. Just email it to Jim. Jim, will, Jim can forward it to me. Perfect. Thank you. So, if you wanted to provide a quick overview and then uh, just answer the questions, thank you. 
Okay, thank and you welcome. very much for uh, allowing me to uh, present this evening. Uh, my name is Sarah Reynolds. I'm with uh, BFL Canada. I am a uh, vice president and a partner in the firm, and uh, we are the new broker of record for the municipalities insurance program. Thank you very much. Uh, just to give you a quick overview of who BFL is uh, and our role with the county and uh, what we do to protect the county. So we are an independent insurance broker. We are Canada's largest uh, commercial insurance broker that is privately held by its employees. We have over 600 employees in 10 offices across Canada. Three of those offices are in the province of Ontario. We do have our uh, main office in Toronto and satellite offices in Waterloo and Ottawa. Uh, public sector and specifically municipalities is a target niche that BFL has specialized in for over 20 years. We've made significant investments in our public sector programs and we currently insure over 80 municipalities for their full property and casualty insurance program. What's important to recognize about BFL is that in being an independent insurance broker, we are not an MGA. An MGA is a managing general agent. An MGA is committed to a specific slate of insurers uh, and they have to support that program. They have no other options. Uh, they work for the insurers. They do not work for the municipality. BFL uh, works with over 40 insurance companies out of our Ontario offices. That en enables us to shop your policies. We can get you the best coverage for the best terms. Whereas MGAs tend to work through a local broker to sell their specific program, and that local broker may or may not have uh, much experience with municipal insurance. Uh, we also pride ourselves on being your risk management advisor. Uh, I myself have my Canadian risk management designation, as do three other members that are assigned to your uh, public sector insurance team. So we are well equipped to be able to advise you on developments in the industry, uh, new products that are available, uh, changes in legislation and how that affects your risk management. We can assist your staff in developing risk control initiatives and we are advocates for you throughout the claims process. So now we get to skip a whole bunch of slides. Woohoo! Okay, so those slides are all very useful pieces of information uh, and they are specific to the insurance coverage that you have purchased. I encourage you to review that information and if you have questions, to please direct them, I suppose, to Lynn, is that? And then Lynn can get those answers from me directly. Okay, very quickly, one small gap in your current uh, insurance program is with respect to volunteer accident insurance. This is an optional uh, type of coverage that some, uh, actually quite a few municipalities do use to help mitigate against uh, liability lawsuits against the municipality from volunteers. And basically what it is is an accidental death and dismemberment program that uh, applies to your volunteers while volunteering. Okay, so if someone does suffer a catastrophic incident while they are doing, um, they're uh, controlling traffic in a parking lot for a local festival and they are volunteering on behalf of the municipality when that happens, um, they are struck by a vehicle and they are killed, there's a $50,000 principal sum that is paid to the estate of the deceased person. And there are a few minor benefits that accompany that, but basically it just shows, it's, it's basically a perk of being a volunteer is that you're there to protect their family, at least in a limited way, should something happen while volunteering. And you can see that the cost for that coverage is very minimal. Uh, it's $7.50 per active volunteer on your roster. So that's not per volunteer. Um, if you have one volunteer that does 10 events, it's still one volunteer. It's not 10 volunteers. Okay, and that's something that you can talk with your staff if that is of interest to you. So more importantly, what we see as a very large gap in your insurance program is your uh, liability limits. So currently the county carries a $25 million uh, limit for your general insurance, your general liability insurance, your errors and emissions insurance, your owned automobile and your non-owned automobile coverage. Um, your cyber liability privacy breach, there are higher limits available, but you do have coverage, which is definitely better than many municipalities. Uh, there are higher limits available. We're not going to talk about that this evening, however. Let's talk about the liability limits, though. 
So what we've done is taken a cross section of uh, about 10% of our over 80 municipalities in Ontario and we've uh, tried to select um, municipalities from a wide range of uh, areas and included in this cross section is another single tier municipality like yourselves. So we've got uh, the County of Brant with a population around 37,000. You'll see that we worked this out so the average was also 37,000. Uh, the smallest municipality in our sampling has 22,000 population and the largest is 56. Okay, just to give you an idea of where we're, what we're looking at. So the liability limits purchased, uh, you'll see that Brant is purchasing 25, the average is 47. Uh, the reason why the average is 47 is because every single municipality in the sampling actually purchases 50, and so you were the only one that brought the average down to 47. Okay, everybody else is doing 50 uh, with Brant at 25. And then looking at what the premiums cost for this coverage, you can see that Brant's current, and this is under our program, your current excess liability premium is 28,000. The average of these municipalities that they are paying is 36,000, with the minimum at 23,000 and the highest at 48. So you are paying less, but you also have less coverage, okay? So there are reasons why we believe that the higher liability limits are not just desired, but necessary. Uh, so municipalities are held to, as you know, are held to a very high, very strict standard or duty of care, which could mean very large awards against them. So in particular, I selected uh, a, a lawsuit from uh, 14 years ago now, Deering versus Scugog. Uh, this was a very uh, a, a tragic road accident where there were two sisters, the Deering sisters, who were both rendered paraplegic in uh, an MVA uh, where they were not at fault. Um, they basically uh, saw someone coming at them on a snow-covered highway. The approaching vehicle appeared to have crossed the center line. They moved to the shoulder to avoid uh, being struck by the other vehicle, lost control of their vehicle, and suffered a tragic accident. Uh, at that time, the judgment was uh, well over $20 million. Uh, if you apply between 2 and 3% inflation to now, that brings your, uh, in today's dollars, between 26 and 30 million. So right off the bat, your 25 million limit would not have been sufficient for that type of a loss. And frankly, since then, in general, public attitudes are changing. And I'm sure you've seen this. You see this every day. You see this at you know, the grocery store and somebody's standing there at the checkout and they're whining about something because it just, you know, it, it, it's not right. Uh, I deserve better than this. Uh, you know, public attitudes are changing. People have a very strong sense of entitlement. Uh, they have very high expectations, particularly for the municipality to which they pay their tax dollars. Um, another issue is pressures of social media can result in public uprisings and endanger your, your reputation. So if you have insufficient limits to cover off what that uh, individual uh, or entity requires in the, to put them back in the position they were before their loss, uh, it can actually have extremely negative repercussions for the municipality. The fact of the matter is, is that claims are costing more than they used to. So for one thing, future care costs are rising dramatically for a couple of reasons. One is that health care costs in general are rising. Uh, but secondly, very unfortunate uh, to say this, but you, know, you, you hope that when something really catastrophic happens that they die because you, they, they can stay alive for a really long time now. You know, when, when somebody had a catastrophic incident in 1950, they didn't live to tell about it. Well, now they live for 50 years to tell about it. And so that means that there's very large uh, awards that can be uh, put against the municipality because somebody needs to provide that person who's been catastrophically injured, they need to provide them with care for who knows how many years. And that was actually the issue with the Deering sisters is that uh, one was actually in her late teens and the other in her early 20s. And there's absolutely no reason that they're not going to live uh, long, healthy lives, but they need it with care. Uh, another reason uh, that uh, we are looking at higher liability limits is that risk management is becoming more and more challenging. Uh, new activities are introduced every day. Anybody here know what Quidditch is? 
Okay, yeah, you know, you're probably all thinking Harry Potter, right? If you're nodding your head. But no, we can actually play Quidditch. People like to run around with a hockey stick between their legs and crash into each other. I don't know why. It seems like a pretty crazy thing to do. But guess what? That's now an activity. And there's a league that actually does this in, in the United States. And it's becoming uh, very popular here in Canada, particularly among university students. So it's only a matter of time before you have someone that wants to rent your soccer field so that they can have a quick Quidditch tournament. Um, bubble soccer is another one of my favorites. So I don't know who thought it was a great idea to, you know, put a bunch of 12-year-old boys on a field wrapped in bubble suits from the neck to the to the knees. Um, but keeping in mind that your 12-year-old boys could be this tall or could be this tall, and they think they're completely invulnerable, uh, invulnerable because, well, I'm in a bubble suit. What could go wrong? Well, their heads aren't protected. Right? So, and, and their necks have no support. So these are the kinds of things that are being introduced on a regular basis. I know that everybody here at this table wants to provide their taxpayers with a lot of fun activities that are great and everything else, but there's a lot of crazy stuff that is, and it's not proven. That's the problem too, is so often what happens is there's no risk management protocols to follow because it's brand new. And so it may result in a really big loss, okay? So we, um, sorry, I'll just move on. So the other issue is class actions. So uh, the situation with a class action is that you can have multiple claimants for one incident. And so that becomes one loss from an insurance standpoint. So, you know, because it's my job to make everything look really, really awful, you know, you have your, uh, your school bus that rolls over on a road that's been determined you have not maintained properly, and you have several grievously injured children. They've all suffered psychological trauma. Uh, the parents are all suffering psychological trauma. You know how it goes. But the fact is, is that they all sue. And they, they have the, the benefit of being able to share the legal cost because it's one lawsuit. So, I mean, it's great for them. It's not for, so good for you if you have multiple children. You know, you've got, on average, what, 45 kids on a school bus. Well, if they all get a million dollars each, um, you've got a fairly serious problem, okay? Joint and several liability. I'm sure that most people in the room have a pretty good sense of what this is. <laughs> You're just loving me. I can tell. <laughs> You're not going to point, but kick me out of the room, are you? Because I don't make the rules. I just try to protect you against them. So joint and several liability, meaning the one percent rule, is its nickname. Uh, even if the municipality is found only one percent liable, it can be held. 100% responsible for the costs awarded uh, for a, a, an injured individual. And then finally, just to look at the facts for your particular municipality, uh, we know that your 2018 insurance budget was well over $1.2 million, uh, your, and that was based on an annual policy. Uh, the cost that we were awarded the uh, municipal insurance program for was 863000 on an annual basis, which has an annual savings of $421,000. Uh, we are asking you to very seriously consider increasing your liability limits from twenty-five dollars to $50 million. The cost is $11,893, which represents less than 1% of your total insurance budget and still results in over $400,000 in savings. Um, in my opinion, it's, it is a no-brainer, but of course I'm the insurance broker, so that's my job to, to tell you what we think is the best use of your funds, and we do think that is a good use. And I hope I was quick enough. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate that and your time All right. Uh, two questions on that 1% issue. Is your company heavily involved in trying to get that changed, and do you see any light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, I would, so yes, uh, we are as heavily involved as any other insurance company is, uh, or, and keeping in mind we are the broker, so it's actually the insur <clears throat> our insurance companies that are more heavily invested in, uh, but we support that and we help to keep them educated as to what's happening. This is not an issue that uh, falls strictly to municipalities. I mean, this is an issue that falls to any large corporation, uh, whether it be Walmart, whether it, like whoever, it doesn't matter as long, it, because basically what the issue is, is whoever has the insurance policy, if they are the only one that hold an insurance policy in a situation where there are multiple um, 
uh, persons who may have been negligent, they're going to go to who has the insurance and make sure that they're awarded at least 1% of the liability. Um, I'd love to say that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I, a per, my personal opinion is no, there is not at this time uh, because there are too many lawyers that stand to uh, lose out on, um, on, on many uh, fees. So it's, it's a long ways away, unfortunately. I wish I could give you better news. And the second one, with our judicial system, just to give an example in Toronto, a driver goes across the bike lane onto the sidewalk, kills a pedestrian. Okay. It goes to court. The judge says, uh, I rule it's no fault of the driver. Now, why he did that, I don't know. <laughs> but now when it comes to the insurance, if there's no judge, no police report saying that the driver was guilty, that must make it awful hard to even come close to, you know, not having to pay an enormous amount out on it. So like what that. I would say in a situation like that, it's highly unlikely that the driver would be found completely not at fault, uh, unless it was a situation where the, yeah, there was something wrong with the vehicle and it's actually been pushed off to GM or to whom, whomever was responsible for that. Actually, I think he was reaching for a water bottle on the front sure of his car. <laughs> anyway. So, so uh, but what does happen is, so if someone is, uh, um, so let's say that that driver has a, uh, has an automobile insurance policy. He's actually managed to have that insurance and it's a million dollar limit for the sake of argument. But the person that has been struck and uh, grievously injured uh, is now awarded a $5 million settlement. The automobile policy will come into play first, but then the next policy will come into play, which will be the municipality who should have had a barrier, who should have had signage, who should have had whatever the the judge determines is the appropriate protection. Uh, and that is quite common. So again, having the limits there to take, because uh, you know, if we all as individuals had to carry $25 million automobile liability limits, none of us could drive a car. So um, that's, you know, I guess part of the, the blessing of having the municipality with the, the higher limit to take care of those individuals who are in fact grievously injured. And the difficult part of that, a lot of the scene was on video. So the judge and the court got to yes. actually see it, but it didn't seem to make any difference, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, uh, I mean, the whether you call it a good thing or a bad thing about our judici judicial system is that it is uh, it, 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 it's fallible because it is just you know, mere people, mere humans that uh, are actually reviewing the evidence and uh, have difficulty doing it from an unbiased uh, standpoint. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that if you do have a grievously, if you, you know, you have a single mother with three kids who now is, a, is paraplegic, um, that there's a huge sympathy factor and people, generally speaking, have a difficulty ignoring that. Very good. Anyone else with any questions? Member Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Three to the presenter. I watched, uh, uh, I, I, I seen a presentation from, I forget, it's the Insurance Bureau of Canada or something, and they're talking about the uh, the enormous claims and how they've gone up nationwide because of climate change. Um, do you see that as a bit of a driver for our costs, or do you think it impacted much for, uh, from a municipality point of view? That's a great question. I would suggest that. Um, now, and I don't have your claims run in front of me, so it's difficult for me to comment on the trend of your current claims. That is, however, something that we will work on as your new broker, is to look at what your claims trends are and see if there are ways that uh, risk can be mitigated in the future so that we can halt or at least slow down those trends. Uh, I would say that uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the most common um, results that we see uh, as a, if you want to accept the fact that climate change is happening are uh, sewer backup events. So you have that massive rainstorm and your infrastructure simply can't handle it. Um, now your municipality carries a sufficient deductible that it's going to eliminate the nuisance claims. So I don't see that being 
a huge issue. Um, however, what you may find is that you get a higher frequency of larger sewer backup claims, perhaps for you know your businesses and what have you. That if they have a you know, uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of stock that has been ruined or um, what have you. So that's really the biggest one. Um, the other piece is, um, and I don't believe that this area is really prone to it, but we do see a higher frequency of tornado activity in in southern Ontario. Uh, but I, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that's a major concern in this area. However, it's not that far away that there have been, um, you know. More, more frequency of events. Uh, I mean, Goderich is a perfect example. That was what four years ago that they were, uh, you know, really done in by a, a, a quite a nasty tornado, ripped right through the downtown, and it caused huge amounts of damage. Um, and that's not something that you can really do a lot to protect yourself against. So what I would say is that municipal business is largely claims. Uh, the, the premiums are largely claims driven, um, but more toward the individual municipality than as a class. So if you are enjoying a good loss uh, record, then your premiums are going to be more stable than if you are a municipality that is not so lucky. Okay. Member Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, if I could. Uh, thank you for your presentation. You mentioned earlier there about the uh, risk management advisors and how there were three others on our team. So how big is our team? <laughs> Good question. So our uh, public sector team, the dedicated team, is six individuals. However, on top of that, we do have our claims team and we also have a marketing team. So, but the public sector uh, that is dedicated to the servicing, the risk management of your account is six people. So that was a trick question, actually. I was looking for everybody, but that's okay. Sorry, what do you mean? That every everybody at BFL was on our team. Well, to be perfectly honest, I don't want everybody at BFL on your team because not everybody at BFL is a municipal insurance specialist, and I only want the people that know what the heck they're talking about to be dealing with your account. Very good, good comeback. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Any further questions? Thank you very much. All right. And thank you for your presentation. Oh, your you're answers. very welcome. I'm just going to open uh, item C, the public hearing, uh, request for noise, noise exemption, exemption. I'm going to ask the first time if any, there's anyone here to speak to this item. I'm going to ask the second time, is there anyone here in the audience who's here to speak to the public hearing for the noise exemption? I'll ask a third time, is there anyone here? Seeing none, then I'll uh, close the, the, the public hearing and then moving on to D. Uh, same question. I'll open the public hearing for the noise bylaw exception. Is I'll ask the first time. Is there anyone here to speak to this? Asking a second time, and a third time. Thank you. The uh, public hearing is now closed. Then I would ask the committee how they would like to deal with items. Item A. Motion to receive. Member Coleman. Member Pierce. All those in favor. And item B. to the appropriate part of the... So you want to move that item up. So you can get a seconder. Member Pierce. Very good. Any discussion on the motion? Questions? I'll call the vote then that we increase the liability coverage. Is it Heather to option two? Option two. Thank you. And that is on item nine A. Okay. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. So moved. Member Eddie and Member Coleman, any questions on that? Staff report. Thank you. All in favor? 
Unanimous again. Wow, everyone's agreeable this evening. <laughs> So then moving along, could I have a motion to adopt the minutes of the previous meetings from January 8th? Member Coleman? Second. Member um, Wheat? Sorry, John. Any discussion on the minutes, questions, corrections? All those in favor? Unanimous again. I see no business arising for minutes. Moving along to the consent items. I will deal with, um, well, I'm pleased to see. Can I have a motion? Member Chambers. I will move that the consent items be received and the recommendations Seeking a seconder. Member Coleman. Anyone want anything pulled? Member Miller? I have a question on number 784. 784. To be pulled. <laughs> to ask a question, do we have to pull it? We have not voted yet. Can I go ahead? It's just, it has to do with the annual uh, municipal aquifer monitoring reports. And uh, we get these every year, hence the word annual. <laughs> and uh, for the most part, we're not mining the aquifers. Um, and, and all the time I've been reading these, it's been pretty steady. I, th I think there was one year, and it was a dry year, I think it was 2012. Um, we, we actually saw a little decrease. And I'm just wondering, um, if I look at the St. George aquifer, and we and we and we expect growth from you know 2,000 to 4,000, um, is that? I guess is is that something that um, we're, we'll keep monitoring? But is that something that we will see through the um, environmental the e uh, the EA? I'm just wondering who uh, who will answer that question for us. Mr. Davidson, if you would, please. So just through you, Chair, uh, so I understand the question. You're asking about the EA for the uh, new water supply? Yeah, for St. George, like I say, and all the time I've been reading these, it's it's been pretty steady, except for the one year. And like I said, I think it was 2012. It was an exceptionally dry year, but there was a bit of a a drawdown in the aquifer and I'm just wondering what's the I guess what, what what's going to be the outcome when we add another 2,000 when we double the size of St. George and is that something that they would answer through the EA process I'm, I'm, I don't know I'll try this for the answer because I really don't understand your question so when they did the pump test for the new uh, boat well filled out on how the load uh, one of the requirements was done come up with a monitoring program to design the test and then monitor the test uh, with the thought of what's going to be the impact to the existing well field as well. So I think the answer to your question is yes. Yes, as in the, 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 we the, think it'll be okay. Be all encompassing, yes. Okay. So as time goes on, um, one of the plans is, is, is for St. Uh, this year we'll start pumping those wells. We want to get the final the equilibrium is going to be for the uh, water quality because it's going to change with the we and uh, that would be the beginning of monitoring program right there to start monitoring the impact is a thing that was well on the existing laws. Okay. Thank you, Alex. And seeing no other questions, then I'll call the vote on all those. All those in favor? No one opposed. Very good. If I could have a motion for the consent items to be received. Okay. Member Coleman, seconded by Member Pierce. Any questions on those? Member Eddy. Is that the reason for it, or what is the reason for it? We're asked to respond, I believe. With a resolution, yes. Pardon? We are asked to respond with a resolution, I think, to the request for one, yes? So I'll pull uh, item four for discussion. All those in favor, one, two, and three. Good. Yeah, fine. Uh, passed. So 
um, you've asked the question, Your Worship, would you like to make an amendment or change? Well, it the may be received? that it's considered by uh, by staff that that we're not in the loop. With, that our response to uh, as requested wouldn't be of value because we have a, a volunteer fire department and we're not eligible to have the medics fire medic operation that's what i feel although in a sense we have one and i don't know how the f volunteer fire fighting uh, force that responds to medical calls really fits into this uh, i wonder about it as i keep hearing about that and i don't know whether you have any insight into it uh, from your uh, point of view or not. Member Wheat. Because I think it's very important what we have. It's essential. What we have is a decision that we made ourselves. Yes. We have our volunteer requirements. Correct. Good point. Good point. So you're content with receiving it? Well, yeah. Very good. Excellent. Seeing no further questions, all those in favor of receiving? Any opposed? Good. Passed. Committee reports. If I could have a motion, please, for 8A, the Renaissance Committee report and the recommendation. Moved by Member Pierce, seconded by Member Powell. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you. So, um, reading through this, I don't see anywhere in there, like it, it's got to, um, you know, it talks about the awnings and stuff like that, but it, nowhere it says how much. Oh, that's a good point. There's no price in here. And usually there is. So, I can't support this when I don't know how much there is. Good point. Do we have anyone here to speak to the community yeah. improvement plan? Um, Mary and I were both at the meeting, and I, I, but I don't have the exact figure. I think it was in the fifteen thousand dollar range. We'll have to get you the exact figure. I didn't realize it wasn't here. We can have it for council. Excellent. You comfortable with that? Yep. Unless do you recall the amount. Is it in? The, no, I don't. Or, recall. No, I don't. And there's nothing in the minute. Sorry. No. Sorry. And even if I did recall. I wouldn't say it because it could be wrong. But I, is it not in the minutes? It should have been in the minutes. Absolutely. We should have that with the budgets and everything before council. Yeah. Very good. We'll get that. All those in favor? In favor of? The recommendation that you moved. No. Okay. So you're not in favor of the recommendation? No. no. I'd like to I think we should. So we could still pass it now and deal with it at council. We could do it at council. That's true. That's true. Good call, Mr. Chair. All those in favor? Any opposed? Very good. With a note that we shall get that information in order to have this passed at council. You can grill me then. I'll be making the presentation of CDC. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, then I guess it'll pass with flying colors without the numbers. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I do know that it was within the guidelines that were approved by council, but that, but we will get you the number. I apologize. Item B, the Tourism Advisory Committee report with a recommendation. Can I have a mover, please? Member Coleman. Seconder? Member Miller. Any discussion or questions on the rec recommendation? All those in favor? Opposed? None? Very good. Staff reports. 9A has been dealt with. Uh, 9A1, sorry. Uh, 9A2, the Christmas holiday schedule. Could I have a motion for the recommendation, please? Member Pierce, seconded by Member Powell. Any questions on that? Very good. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none. Very good. Passed. I would welcome the general manager's update. Good evening, Robin. <clears throat> it's 
through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Heather. I know I'm not a very loud talker, so. <laughs> so um, just to let you know that we have begun the short-term accommodation planning process. Um, we've got a lot of different options on the table right now. And before anything is finalized with regards to any temporary uh, space that we may need to utilize, we'll bring that back to Council for approval. I thought I would give you a bit of a lengthy um, update on our recruitment. Um, as you know, there was many positions approved in the budget. Um, so I'll just give you a bit of um, an update on who we recently hired. So we have three new people who are just about to start, health and safety specialists, um, Dave Beatty, and a GIS technician named Ali Dizkowski will both be starting next week. We have a student that's just started to uh, uh, undertake an IT inventory. Um, internally, we have Mike Mandel's accepted the water quality technical specialist. Mandy Garbedian, Garbedian has accepted the administrative assistant position in development services. And Sheena Yerrick has accepted the permanent accessibility coordinator position. So we are currently um, in the process of hiring 36 uh, people which includes 12 part-time paramedics and 11 summer students and then uh, a number of other positions. It's just a lot of recruitments going on um, all at once. Yes. We have three positions that are currently posted. One is the water quality technician, lot grading specialist, and the solicitor. Uh, so those all close, I think, the end of next week. So, and then after that, we still have seven more positions to post. <laughs> Uh, I believe in January, we, or maybe it was December, we said that we would bring a report back to Council on the gravel pits. Um, we said we'd bring it back in February, but we don't have it done yet. There's been a lot going on with tax season and our, our new software implementation. So we'll be bringing that report next month. And just an FYI, we're going to have some preventative maintenance done on these desks in here over the next few months. Uh, we have Mr. McAlpine, who originally built them, is going to come in and do some uh, sanding, oiling, and then uh, a top coat with some uh, wax. So that'll be staged over the next few months, probably into the summer. I take personal responsibility for that one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you did. I was going to paint them. And that's it for my update. Thank you. Any questions for the general manager? Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you. Moving right along, operations general manager's update. Michael, always good to see you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple of updates. I have departmental updates at the, uh, at the at the both the community services committee last week, and I'll have one tomorrow at Public Works. But a couple of uh, green energy projects: the Adidas Solar Project. It is now uh, completed, and connection is pending. We signed the connection agreement with the. Uh, with uh, Energy Plus today, so uh, it should be connected any day now. Uh, I still have a joint venture agreement pending for that. The fit rules got very complicated on, on us this last round, and so we haven't actually got that joint venture agreement completed. We have an agreement in principle that was the original agreement we had with the three partners, Adidas, the county, and Six Nations, but the joint venture agreement is still pending, so I would hope to have that in front of council in March. Uh, the Penman's Dam at the last meeting, uh, last corporate development meeting, you approved uh, hiring a, a consulting firm to do a, um, a, a condition assessment of that dam. We had a site meeting today. It was cold out there. Um, but the, uh, they will be starting the in-river assessment. That's putting divers in the water uh, any day now. So as soon as the condition's clear, they will go in. Temperature is not an issue to these divers. They dive in the North Sea, apparently. So, <laughs> um, But we just wanted to, I wanted to give uh, committee a heads up, and we will be doing a press release, because I think once you put divers in the river, people may think the worst. So we will be doing a press release to the, uh, to the public indicating there will be divers in the river in the next couple days. Don't worry. Uh, and we'll be circulating all of the members of council as well when that's, that's pending. Uh, shortly after that, then they'll be uh, launching a small, basically a, a modular barge, and it'll be uh, parking uh, in, on just above the dam, and they'll be doing core samples into the dam. So we anticipate that happening over the next couple of months, again, weather and river flows committing, uh, permitting. But we would like to try to get that work done before we see the big spring flows, but we could see spring flows at any time now, so given the weather conditions. That's my update on those two projects, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Michael. Any questions for the General Manager of Operations? M Member Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, quick, quick question, Michael, because I've seen on the news tonight, uh, salt shortage. How's our supply of salt? 
Mr. Chair, we, we have a, a, enough salt to get us through the winter, um, but there, there, is a, there is certainly a, a provincial salt shortage evolving right now. Uh, so so we, uh, we have uh, 10 loads coming in right now uh, as the rest of our order, but I think uh, most municipalities are being put on uh, basically salt rations from the suppliers, so uh, we'll see how, how things go. But we, we're optimistic we've got, a, we've got enough supply in the domes right now. So. Very good. Member Eddie. Well, I think it's been really great to be optimistic, but we really don't know how long winter's going to last. <laughs> so I don't know how we ha can say, predict, that we have enough salt till the winter's over. Noted. Any other questions for the general manager? Seeing none. Thank you. Oh, Member Powell. Maybe I'm off Almost side. didn't see your hand there. Just for interest, in Quebec, small town, they took one street. They're using wood chips to see if that might be a viable alternative. So if worse comes to worse, look for wood chips somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. That was interesting. Noted? Noted. Noted. Very good. Thank you. Thank you and uh, Development Services <laughs> General Manager. Mark, good evening. Uh, just a few things from our last meeting, or since our last meeting. Um, the development engineering reviewers are going to be uh, attending a webinar uh, to look at, um, I believe it's in March, look at um, a, a product which is uh, pervious, con impervious, sorry, pervious concrete pavers. Uh, it's tied into LID, looking at the product, seeing what the issues are with it, and uh, I believe that's in March. Um, we have a few subdivision agreements that are going to be coming forward, hopefully at the next um, meeting in March. Uh, they are Mile Hill Subdivision, uh, 1039 Rest Acres Road and Brookfield. Um, they're all anxious to get, uh, to get going right away so registration can happen. Uh, so we're going to be looking at timing and how quickly we can bring these forward to get the council resolution to sign into them. Um, the other thing that uh, with the Brookfield subdivision, uh, as I had reported, I think previously, uh, the plans were waiting for some registry office information to come forward, which is specifically PIN numbers. It's, it's tied to a, uh, a cul-de-sac that was created on a budding property. PIN numbers had to be created for it. The registry office has released those PIN numbers. They are with the surveyor. The plans are being finalized and are gonna be brought into the county for signatures in the near future, and I think the most recent email I got from the consultants was today. Um, I offered up um, some times I'm available uh, to make this a priority so that the, uh, so the plan can get registered ASAP. Um, and uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your report. And uh, our CAO has courageously volunteered to give the Economic Development Strategic Investments General Manager's update. So, Paul. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I could do it, actually. I was going to do it under the CAO's update, but the only thing I was going to say about economic development was that Allison was inducted as the president of the Economic Development Council of Ontario in a uh, banquet in Toronto on Wednesday night. I went down to... Um, support her. There's 1,100 members in this organization. There was a conference of 700 people that gone all week and was culminated on the, the sun uh, on the Wednesday night, and uh, it, was, it was quite a quite a thing. All the as I say, almost every municipality in the province is represented there. You could see by the various awards that were called, from the large ones to the small ones up north. And so we've done a press. We put together a press release and. It's on our web page, our Jostle site, and I think there's a press release going out. Anyway. That's a feather in all our caps. Yes, I think so. Excellent. Thank you. Any questions on that? Member Miller. Just out of curiosity, um, is Allison away this week, I'm assuming, or is she ill, or yeah, she'll be she, back next week? She had vacation. I thought maybe Michael Bryan needed to be here, but she was on vacation this week for a portion of the week. Maybe you can answer this. Um, are we having the uh, Business Excellence Awards again this year? Well, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. We're doing that. Okay. That's done at the Salute to Brant Business. There's a subcommittee, Mr. Mayor, that um, they have on. I don't think you're on it, but there is a subcommittee that's that's going through their regular process. I doubt there. I doubt that the um, requests for nominations are out yet. 
because the banquet isn't usually until the fall. Uh, it'll be something that'll come out in the spring, likely. So that means there's a committee that the mayor's not on? <laughs> well, it's a subcommittee, but it reports up to his committee. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Seeing none, I'll move along to communications. If I could have a motion to receive those, please. Member Pierce, seconded by <laughs> Member Wheat. It's a race. Any <laughs> any questions on those? Very good. I'll call the vote to receive. All those in favor? Very good. Any opposed? Seeing none. Thank you. Passed. Uh, matters referred by council. None. Other business. None. CAO's update. Paul, if you had okay. anything. Okay. To add. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple more things. Uh, Further an update at the last meeting, we had a meeting at the staff level with the City of Brantford regarding ambulance governance models and there, there's a draft being put together actually by their solicitor that we'll see and if it looks the way we talked about it, then we would bring it back to the two councils and recommend it. Um, but say, similar kind of idea to the, the John Noble Home, although it's not, it's not an independent standing body, but joint committee. Um, I'm sorry. Member Eddy. Uh, does this involve the uh, re-examination of all the cost-sharing agreements between the two municipalities, as has been mentioned? Yes. Yeah, so that that came up at our meeting. Michael, you're listening to this, are you? Yes. Maybe you can elaborate on what part I missed. But because if it does, I wonder if you're going to use the model that we have with the emergency measures coordinator where we will be paying using as an example for cost sharing 50 percent sharing rather than the assessment or population basis for sharing costs well okay I, i'll tell you that if any part of a negotiation i'd be involved with would not have a 50-50 cost sharing with the city. I think that the emergency management coordinator was a, a one-off. It was relatively small dollars. We're going to be spending equal amount of time with both municipalities, and I think we just thought it was a good way, good cost savings for both municipalities. But with respect to cost sharing, uh, there, there are different models, as you know, that can be employed. And um, Michael, it did come up at the meeting, and where was that left? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. You, you'll recall last year we received notice from the city of their uh, their intent to not renew the cost sharing agreement oh. and renegotiate it. And then the city had a bunch of staffing issues, and then they further uh, in, uh, uh, notified us of their uh, acceptance of that cost sharing agreement, moving continuing on a month to month basis until right. replaced. That's so the John Noble Home Agreement that we brought forward at the end of last year uh, replaced one section of that cost sharing agreement. As the CAO mentioned, we're now looking at ambulance governance. We believe, I think, that uh, an ambulance uh, agreement would, would then come forward and it would replace that section of the cost sharing agreement. And we could see that as the process moving forward to basically revise and renegotiate the cost sharing agreements by a bunch of single agreements because that, that one lump sum cost sharing agreement is cumbersome. Yeah, it, uh, it, it's, it was good in its time, but it's, it's certainly not, yeah. not functioning really well for now. So that's, that's how we see this unfolding, <coughs> us moving forward on a case-by-case -case basis yeah. and knocking these off one at a time, bringing Thank forward you. standalone agreements. So. Very good. Mr. I have a couple more quick things. Health Hub, we're, we're continuing to, to meet and pull together a business plan for you to, to report back. Um, and um, Roma, we, I don't think it's been reported here, but I went down to the meeting along with the mayor and Michael, and was there anybody else at that meeting? Brian, sorry, I, I knew you were there. And we met with the Minister of Transportation regarding the business. Bishop's Gate interchange. I I think with this was about the first week that this minister had been on the job because she was a minister of natural resources before, but she's also from Cambridge and is quite familiar with gravel related issues. So there, I detected uh, a degree of sympathy from the minister with respect to gravel and the pressure it's putting on our road system. She referred us to senior staff within our ministry to continue dialogues, and that's where we're at. Very good, member. We should have a distinct advantage on the project 
because all of the traffic from Trusser Road ends up on Bishopsgate Road, headed for 403. So, you know, we're helping the Minister of Transportation and her Cambridge riding out by providing this. That's a great way of looking at things. <laughs> Member Miller. Thank you for your endorsement. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Three to Paul. The the, the interchange itself, it, it just seems awfully odd that they would expect the County of Brant to pick up the full tab, but I digress. No, because won't. I want to ask you, um, as far as the gravel pits go, who makes the pitch to them to, to kick in or ask them to kick in? And how, how, how is that handled? Well, when is that handled? Okay, I guess I'll, I'll let the mayor jump in here in a sec. But he, did, the mayor, coordinated a meeting what three, two, three years ago on this with all the gravel producers. Four was it? Four years ago now? It's quite a while ago. With the gravel producers that conceivably would be accessing that interchange. I did. Did you want to pick up on that? What develops, of course, is to be seen, but hopefully. They'll be reminded of that, and there was extreme interest in the project from the aggregate. And why shouldn't, wouldn't there be? Why shouldn't there be? So we hope that uh, develops into uh, cash, so to speak. Very good. And I'll be following up with the Minister of Transportation on this matter. Any other questions for the CAO? Very good. Thank you then, Paul. I would look for a motion to move in camera to deal with the... Uh, oh. I, I will move that. Uh, if I can make the announcement first. Yes. That the uh, annual general meeting of the Long Point Transportation District Authority is on Friday, February 23rd. Oh, right. Thank you for the announcement, seconded by Member Goldman. All those in favor? Any opposed? 